Ladies and gentlemen, behind me are two of the most iconic off-roaders ever built. What are you doing, Tommy? All right. Just checking for leaks on the Defender, but what we have behind me is the Toyota FJ Cruiser and the Land Rover Defender. Yeah, and in this video, we're gonna talk about what makes them so iconic, and then, of course, we're gonna take them off-road and find out, well, which one's better, and of course, Let's get started with styling, Tommy, because that FJ, look at the ears, look at the big headlights. It looks like a scared rabbit. I'll take a rabbit over inflated Kia Soul any day of the week. The FJ Cruiser is a retro-designed throwback 4x4 that debuted in the late 2000s, and it's got styling roots in the original Toyota FJ40, the iconic first-generation Land Cruiser. The Land Rover Defender has its roots in post-war Britain, and it had many, many different variations over the years, but here in the US, we only got it in kind of the 1990s, and it's come back for 2020 in this big, ginormous, discovery-looking thing. And in this video, we're gonna compare them. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, this comparison makes no sense because the FJ is no longer being built. Well, you are wrong. It is being built, it's just not being sold in America. You can buy it in places like South Africa, the Middle East. That's right, yeah, but in the U.S. we only get the 200 series Land Cruiser, which is the ginormous SUV that Toyota built. And you know, as an aside, Tommy, I would give Toyota just a hint. Bring this back if you're going to do away with the Land Cruiser, because this has a lot more sellable cred than the Land Cruiser, which we love, but is so expensive that it only sells like 3,000 units every year. Well, let's get back to our comparison. Here in the US, the FJ Cruiser was only available with one engine, the 4-liter V6. It's the same engine they use in the current 4Runner. It was also in the Tacoma. It was also in the 70 Series Land Cruiser abroad. It is an iconic engine. It develops enough power. I don't know. It's like 260, 270 horsepower. Made it to a 5-speed automatic transmission, although a 6-speed manual was available. Now, for 2020, of course, Land Rover brought back the Defender. And around the world, there is a plethora of different diesel and gasoline engine choices. But here in America, we only get two. We get a 4 cylinder turbo and we get this hybrid. Yep, it's a mild hybrid 6 cylinder turbo that puts out just under 400 horsepower. Now, that vehicle has, of course, the old boat anchor, Tommy, whereas this has the modern, the new, the cutting edge tech. Mm, old new engine, you say? Yes. In a Land Rover? Yes. In a four wheel drive off roader? Yes, exactly. Hmm, interesting. Of course, he's talking about the big R in the room, reliability, and the two companies have a vastly different approach. To, to make something and they keep building it forever, and Land Rover, well, they like to be in the cutting edge. They like to be in the forefront of the newest technology. Much like the uh, first generation Freelander, which is legendary for its longevity, as I recall. Oh. There is the LR3. That is an exceptionally reliable vehicle. Even there, I think you're gonna get some Well, if you, 2006 to 2009 LR3 is an exceptionally reliable vehicle. Tommy, I know we each have our favorite cars here, but you have to admit the interior of this new Defender is purposeful, it's rugged. Uh, it's using a lot of really cool materials like this neoprene-like material. I love the way that the steering wheel is designed. It's got the two modern displays, and there's a lot of little cubbies for all of your stuff. It just looks really purposeful, off-roady, uh, and a really great place to spend some time. It is very nice. I actually don't have much to say that's snarky, Dad, because it did a great job on the interior, and I think it is visually nice, it feels nice, and yeah, it's, it's a good place to be. So the interior of the Toyota is obviously more down market than the Defender because this was a much more affordable vehicle, but there's so many cool things like this body colored insert here on the center of the dashboard. I like the big chonky dials and the basic radio. It's, it's pretty good. You know what we're missing? What? The bat sign because this is like being in the bat cave back here, Tommy. It's dark, it's dank, it's clove, claustrophobic, and it's really tight. I do have some things that you do not have, Dad, in that Discover uh, d Defender over there. You mean like the uh, clam doors that uh, lock you in the back here if you uh, don't have a willing uh, front seat driver to let you out? Yes, I do have those, but I also have a proper parking brake a real transfer case lever that I can just engage by moving left and right, and a proper shifter that is not some little toggly thing. Yeah, and enough plastic to fill a super tanker. Yes, it does uh, kind of scream a little bit like 
my first Hot Wheels in here, but that's okay because these do last forever. The plastics are kind of, you know, scratchy, but they will easily last 250, 300,000 miles. You know what the coolest thing in here is, Tommy? What? It's that inclinometer over there. That huh? is so cool. I love that little binnacle. And of course, the three little uh, gauges there mirror the three windshield wipers. And I gotta say, uh, very few cars in the world have three wipers. And to me, that is something that I love. Walking up uh, Tombstone. This is the uh, new hill we've been using to test all of our crossovers and SUVs uh, since they closed Gold Mine Hill. And we're about 10,000 feet above sea level, so I'm out of breath because it is very steep. And there are two parts to this. Uh, there is, uh, well, there are the two vehicles down there. Tommy's getting ready to take the uh, FG up first. This way is truth. It's just steep. And let me show you. Sort of kind of run it out. It gets worse as you get higher. Loose gravel, ruts, um, you know, basic stuff that a crossover with just regular four wheel drive would probably get hung up on. Um, and over here, this is Dare, the much harder part. I'll show you why. Because not only do you have uh, ruts, but you have. Uh, Ruts with uh, big rocks and boulders, as you can tell. And this is where most crossovers get hung up because the approach angle is, uh, uh, well, not good enough. First up is the Toyota. So I'm gonna go into four wheel drive low. Simple as that. I'm gonna push my A track button. That is the advanced off road traction control. And then. I'm just gonna drive because the Toyota should have no problem tackling this hill. This does have a five speed automatic transmission, although the six speed manual was a really cool um, available option as well. Super low range, and this hill, even though it is what 25, 30 degrees, something like that, uh, it's nothing for the Toyota. It just powers right up. But now we do have a pretty good set of Cooper all terrain tires on this beast. They're not as aggressive as like a proper mud terrain, but they're not bad actually. Definitely being pushed back into my seat a little bit, but it's crawling up no issues. This thing is so good off-road. You know, I really would like to do some of the harder core trails here in Colorado, but it is the beginning of January and so many of them are snowed out and closed, so we'll have to save that till the spring and summer. All right, Tommy, how did that go? It was just too easy. The FJ Cruiser in low range crawl up pretty much everything. It really is like a Wrangler competitor and less of a Defender competitor. Yeah, it didn't put a wheel wrong going up uh, Truth, but let's see how it does coming down. So going down the hill, nothing too fancy in terms of tech. I don't even think I have a hill descent control. So let me go into first gear on the transmission, low range. That's pretty much all you need, really. Super, super simple. Now, okay, it's a little bit too quick. I'm gonna have to engage the brake. Now, unlike the Land Rover, the Toyota has a selectable four-wheel drive, so you have a two high, a four high, and a four low. That Land Rover is always in four-wheel drive. It's got a full-time system, so slight difference there. Didn't put a wheel wrong. So what makes that FJ um, such a great off-roader, of course, is that it's got the bones that you need when you're off-roading. And let me show you as now he's gonna come up uh, the dare side. So once again, this is easier, that is truth. And this is a little bit harder because of the rocks and boulders and such, that's dare. Now you can tell it's got a really good approach angle. Uh, it's got a really good departure angle. It's got a great breakover angle. Uh, because it's such a short wheelbase, we've got off-road tires on this. And as you can see, we'll see how it does over here because this is where it gets a little tricky. He's gonna go the hard way. Hey, go the hard way, dude. Go right. Hard way. In a Toyota, uh-huh. Solid rear axle. It's articulating like a dream. I'm trying to get it off kilter, there we go. Yeah, so A-Track is not quite as sophisticated as the drive modes in the Defender, but it still is excellent at finding spinning wheels and applying brakes. It'll do most things that you actually need it to do. Very rarely do you need to engage the rear locker. It's there if you need it, but you really don't need it. 
hardly at all with A-Track. Hey Tommy, that thing didn't put a wheel wrong. Yeah, it's hard to find anything apart from a... Super tricky trail that really challenges the FJ Cruiser. It's got a compliant ride. I mean, underneath it's basically a forerunner, more or less. Just less practical and looks cooler. But it's uh, it's amazing what these things will do. And the forerunner still isn't all that different from this vehicle underneath. It's a basic old school design that just works. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, pretty phenomenal. Look at that. No problem whatsoever, even going through those ruts. The suspension is just really working well. All right, well, there you have it. There goes the FJ. Cake. That easy. Cake. Same test in the Land Rover Defender, so let's go ahead and play with some of the terrain modes. I'm going to push in on this button and use this dial. And let's go, mm, sure, we'll do rock crawl, why not? I'm going to go into neutral here, select low range to activate rock crawl. I think what it'll do is ask me to select um, low there. And then you can see it's raising the suspension. I do apologize if I'm coming across a little harsh on the Defender, but hear me out. I love Landover as a brand. My issue is they already make a large, very comfortable SUV. It's called the Discovery. Uh, actually, they make another very large, very comfortable SUV. It's called the Range Rover Sport. Actually, they make a very large, comfortable SUV called the full-size Range Rover. It's just too many. I mean, do something different with the Defender. This is your namesake. This is supposed to be the more affordable, hardcore rock crawler, and it's just another very large, comfortable SUV. Although, don't get me wrong, it is exceptionally good off-road. I was poking fun at the terrain response earlier, but it is the best in the industry. It's better than Jeep. It's better than... Uh, what I think Toyota does, at least in terms of dialing and modes and actually making a difference in the way the car drives. So I'm in rock crawl right now, super aggressive on the traction control, really prohibits wheel spin. The air suspension, it's not quite as comfy as the steel springs on the Toyota. When you jack them up, they just become like rocks. It's The whole thing is just really firm. Uh, in normal mode, it's much better, but the second you get into the off-road heights, oh, it's, it's pretty rough. All right, Dad, well, I made it up in the Defender. Now, one thing I observed with the, that was a bad shift. What the heck was that? <laughs> and when I came up here in the off-road height on the suspension, it gets pretty hard. It does really well. I mean, the, uh, the traction control is able to cope for the wheels that lift up a little bit, but it's a little bit too firm for my liking. You need to go on at tippy toes. That's exactly what you're doing, right? By putting that suspension up, it does become firm. That's always a downside, so you gain ability, but you lose Drivability. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, coming down the hill, I could engage many different modes, including uh, all-terrain progress control. Uh, it also, of course, has various um, levels of actual hill descent control. It's almost overwhelming to figure out where they all live, though. Yeah, you know, uh, the more tech, uh, the more um, complexity, but the thing does have an auto mode, Tommy, which... Uh knows exactly uh, you know what terrain you're on so all fails put an auto all right, I figured out all-terrain progress control. It's set to two miles an hour. Ooh, it does do a nice job of holding me at exactly two though. That's pretty cool. Making our way down. Oh yeah, no issues. Let's try the harder side of the hill in the Land Rover. Appears to be a gentleman driving up the hill in a WK Grand Cherokee. Pretty, pretty modified WK Grand Cherokee, I must say. super easy when we do it with the FJ and uh, the Defender but I think that's a pretty good example of how hard this really is I mean that's a Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, that struggled going up this uh, and that really shows you the difference 
between you know the vehicles that we're testing and you know your everyday kind of vehicles a lot of people are driving all right come on up tommy so one thing that is um definitely different between the land rover and the Toyota is that if you don't actually dial in the a track or the four-wheel drive system on the Toyota You're gonna be stuck real quick and that can catch you off guard in some situations The Land Rover is fully automated pretty much. I mean the center diff lock is automated It's always in four-wheel drive So you're never gonna be surprised if something doesn't work in the Defender because the computer will figure it out Whereas the Toyota you got to move a lever or push a switch All right, well, let's see how you do up this deep bed. Go down the uh, hard route <laughs> Sure, I guess I'll also play with my all-terrain progress control, why not? Let's see how that works. Come on, work. Alright, I am going to play with it using my foot, actually. Uh, the tech in this is impressive, but it's also a little bit overwhelming if you can't figure out how to make it work. But that's just because my IQ is too low for the classy Defender. The cameras are neat. I do actually, one of the only vehicles I like the camera system in, it's super detailed. Oh. Even without the rear locker, the traction control system is so quick to respond to various changes in wheel height and wheel spin. It's very impressive. Very impressive indeed. You can, thankfully, get an active locking rear diff in the new Defender. You really don't need it. For the kind of stuff that most people are going to be doing in these $71,000 frigs, it's amazing what they'll do just with uh, normal traction control and the automated center diff lock. This is a much bigger vehicle that I can definitely see the uh, size difference and feel the weight difference but the computers do such a good job of uh, helping me along. Coming down the hill now. I'm not sure I would use off-road height on the suspension very often. It just makes it so rock hard there's like no down travel. Luckily it has pretty good clearance even in its normal height. Big hole here. Not a whole lot of underbody protection in this Defender. So Tommy, yeah. you took the exact same route line that the Jeep took uh -huh. and he really struggled. Right. I mean, you know, sometimes it's hard to show people just how difficult this is. Uh, but I think there you get a real sense of the differences between, you know, what a dedicated off-roader can do and what, even though the Jeep is a dedicated off-roader, but when you've got the right tires, and you've got the right, you know, equipment. Well, I think it just comes down to um, the legendary traction control equipped in the Land Rover, which is very good. Even with the advanced off-road capability group. Also independent suspension, so it doesn't flex quite as well as the Toyota. It does feel very rigid though. Unibody, but it is a very, very stiff unibody. And the steering is good, really good steering. It's not that quick, but you don't need it to be that quick in a four-wheel drive. Now we purchased both of these cars for a long-term review, and you may be thinking to yourself, it's not fair because, well, the Defender, the original one, the inexpensive one we bought was 50,000, and that one is well over 70,000. But that 2014 FJ that we bought with 50,000 miles isn't cheap. How much should we pay for it? 33,500. That's right. And next year it'll be worth 33,500 and the year after that it'll be worth 33,000 whereas a year from now that Defender probably will be worth anywhere between 9 and about $14. <laughs> you know, given the depreciation. You know, Tommy, uh, this is an iconic car and who knows, maybe it might be worth 33,000 a couple of years from now. Okay, you got me on that one. But the point of this video is, you know, iconic cars of course evoke emotion and they evoke passion and I think both the brands have done that correctly. Yes, for very different reasons but they both do have a lot of off-road worthiness and they're both very cool vehicles just two different breeds. Yeah so um, I guess my takeaway would be Toyota please bring it back we'd love to get it back. Mm -hmm.